I'm Christina Rea, and welcome to Breaking Out of Breaking In, a practical filmmaking podcast about taking your creative career into your own hands and making great work that gets seen without playing the Hollywood game. Or at least while changing the rules. Hi, I'm Brie Castellini, your other co-host, and today we're breaking down moving to L.A. If you'd like to suggest a new topic, send us a compliment, ask us a question, or otherwise get in touch, you can hit us up on Twitter or Instagram at BreakingOutPod or via email at BreakingOutOfBreakingInPod at gmail.com. I don't know why I said at at the beginning. That's not how email works. And if you want deeper dives into everything we cover on this podcast, plus custom templates and infographics, subscribe to our Patreon for as little as $3 a month at patreon.com slash breaking out pod. But without further ado, I am so excited to introduce you to our guest, Kim Garland. Kim, please introduce yourself in as much or little detail as you prefer. Well, hello. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, yep, I'm Kim Garland. I'm a writer and director, and I am currently a TV writer um, working on the sci-fi show Chucky and just finished wrapping a room for a new Netflix show. It's a sci-fi horror comedy. It hasn't been announced yet, so I can't say the title, but it's, sure. it'll be announced within the next couple of weeks. Perfect. Uh, well, I thought it might be a useful place to start to start wherever you think it makes the most sense to, to kind of give us the story of your career so far. So like as far back as you want to start as, you know, it seems relevant to how you got to where you are today, writing for television shows and streaming shows, which are functionally the same thing. Let's be real. Um, I'm really curious, like what step-by-step step got you to where you are in your particular version of events? Um, so I guess it started, like, I'm one of those, like, people who always wrote. Um, and so I was always a writer as a kid, you know, pretty typical that way um, for a lot of folks who are writing today. I went to college, um, did my undergrad in creative writing. So I started off in fiction. Me too. Um, and I was, yay! <laughs> and I went uh, from college right into book publishing. So, like, I totally, yeah. Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I worked in book publishing for a while and never stopped writing. Um, but kind of found I, I went to a school that was kind of a, a typical Western canon. Um, you know, uh, one of those schools that you're writing literature, you're writing, you know, you're not writing genre, you're not writing commercial fiction. And so I really did try to fit that mold um, and really didn't think of another mold for myself because it was what I was reading. And so it made sense. That's where I would be writing. But I ultimately found it just never was a great fit for me. And my early passion as a kid, I, I when I first started thinking of what, what do you want to do for a living? I want to be an actor. And I think that's because when you want to be a storyteller, what do you see? You see on the screen actors. And so that's yeah. kind of your first idea, right? It's the first thing you think, because that's how I get to tell stories. Um, by the time I was an undergrad, I saw, I realized there was more to the world than acting. And I realized I really wanted to be on the writing side. Um, so I kind of took my passion for TV and film and all the stories I loved growing up blended it with the type of stuff I was excited to write, which was much more genre, and thought I really need to make that transition out of fiction and into film and TV, because it seemed like a place where that type of writing, um, there's a lot of it, it's it's appreciated, it's, it's lucrative, it's just all those things that can be tougher in fiction if you just haven't found your voice. And that was just so much of it. I couldn't find that literary fiction voice. I eventually transitioned to film and TV, and it was such a, a, a comfortable match. And in my case in particular, early on, I thought I was going to write comedy. Um, that felt really natural to me. It's it's just where I thought I was starting. And um, when I was starting to transition from fiction to screenwriting, one of the things I was very struck by was in fiction, when you write, you're writing directly to your audience for the most part. There really aren't that many stages. There's an editor, you know, and the editor does incredible work, but really you feel like it's your voice right into the, the directly into the brain of the reader. Um, whereas in film and TV, it became so clear that there are a million people between mm -hmm. the writer and the audience. And I felt like, how am I going to make this transition from fiction to screenwriting if I don't understand all those other steps, if, if, you know, it just felt like I was always stopping right when, uh, when the next stage of storytelling would be beginning if I didn't learn to direct. So, and again, Christina and I go back and this is how we know each other, mm -hmm. um, is I decided I'm going to learn to do this. I can't afford film school. I can't afford the debt. I already did a super expensive undergraduate. So I decided to take the money I could put together and start making short films. And that seemed like it had the potential to be a great way to learn how to write for the screen was to write, direct, and edit. And anyone who's done that knows the second you are completely done with a film, you've learned so much 
all you want to do is go right back to the beginning and take everything you've learned and do it all again. Um, mm -hmm. And so that was really my introduction to this world was making short films, trying to learn how the heck do you write for, for the screen. Where were you based during this time? New York? New York City, cool. born and raised. So, you know, cool. native New Yorker um, with honestly all the advantages that that does come with. I, I always want to emphasize that there is an advantage to being born in New York or, or L.A. Mm -hmm. um, you see that world. It's right in your face. It feels real. Um, sure. And I know that 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 is one of those little privileges that we do have as those particular big cities is, you know, there's so much opportunity. There's so many resources. Um and so, yeah, so, so I was in New York and making films and, and loving it. I mean, honestly, it was really fun uh, meeting the most incredible people. Going on the film festival circuit was and is still one of my all-time favorite things. I cannot wait to get back to it. Um, <laughs> but what I ultimately found was, uh, you know, I was doing different jobs in New York. I worked briefly at MTV as a story producer. Oh, same. <laughs> I think everyone has at some point, if you work in media in New York, has worked for MTV. I, I was just having a coffee with a writer the other day, virtual coffee, um, sure. and uh, he was from New York and literally said the same thing. He's like, everybody worked at MTV. I was like, everybody at some point. Said, <laughs> for MTV I, everyone if, I've if you want to make a dollar. Crazy. Yeah. And I kind of got to the point where, you know, and it's all so personal. And I'm going to preface this part of the story with everyone's journey is so unique and individual. Absolutely. And it's not mm -hmm. just the things you see about a person that tell you what their journey is like. It's really all the things you don't know that tells you what a person's journey is like. Yeah. So this yeah. is super my personal point of view is I got to the point in New York where I was feeling like, a weird way to phrase it, but I felt like I'm hitting the edges of the New York industry. Like I was doing enough things and meeting enough people and getting involved with enough projects and putting out enough feelings, all those things that you do. And it didn't feel like I was necessarily going anywhere. I started to get this treadmill feeling. Um, and I know that's natural for anybody breaking in. It, pro it may or may not have anything to do with where I was, but it's where I was personally. Um, and I hit a point where my life, my personal life, and this is always the stuff that people, you know, don't understand when they give you advice. My personal life had changed in a radical way, whereas I wasn't as connected to my family. There was a lot of things that normally hold you and those roots that keep you grounded where you grew up. I'd kind of lost a lot of that. Um, Combine that with feeling like I had really stalled professionally. And then the last part was, and this is all leading to moving to LA, um, the last part was, when you're a native New Yorker, and especially when you get into like college age and older, you start meeting all these people who come to New York to have this adventure, to live this dream, to take a shot at that thing they've always wanted. And for good or evil, they come and they do that. And these became so many of my friends. And there was a part of me that felt like, yes, the extreme privilege of getting to grow up in New York City right there. I didn't have to pick up and move to just jump right into this, you know, world level industry. At the same time, I'd never lived, really lived anywhere else. I briefly, you know, at one point in Pennsylvania, but so briefly. Um, and I wanted that adventure. And I felt like it's something I was missing. And my husband grew up in Northern California. So he did that. We met in New York. So he'd had that whole adventure and I'd seen it firsthand. And it just felt like maybe that was the next move. Maybe I needed to pick up everything I had, husband, son, <laughs> and move across the country and try out not just a new place, to go for this career, but like a whole new life, new lifestyle. I really wanted that. And that was so much of it. Um, and so we decided, I, I'm trying to think when it was, it was 2017. Uh, we moved, uh, we, we arrived in LA August of 2017. And we, once we decided to move, we were like in 11 weeks, we picked up everything we owned, drove cross country with the boy and the dog in the back seat and started new out here in LA. And then from there, if you want to just jump right into it, I don't know if you've got questions. Well, actually, uh, there's the what you were kind of talking about, about like hitting the edge of New York City is kind of dovetails perfectly with a question we have from Kevin Seafried, who asks, what are things you should attempt to accomplish creatively and or networking wise before going west or going whatever direction you happen to be going, depending on where you're starting? Should you have a certain number of short films, web series? So I'm curious for you, Kim, like what did it mean to you to be at the edge of your of your of New York, what what did that look like for you? So that's a great question, and and again, it really does vary. Of course, probably the best way to tell you what I needed was I technically didn't need anything, and everyone tells <laughs> you you do. Everyone tells you you need 
X number of samples, X number of connections. If you could have reps, if you can have that, they tell you 5 million things that would be ideal, but it's ideal. Like what's mm -hmm. ideal in life? Nothing. Um, <laughs> in the most technical sense, I could have showed up with absolutely nothing because what I found was all of the films I made really didn't, didn't have any impact out here. I'll be very honest. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't find it opened any doors. I didn't, it didn't distinguish me particularly in any way with the way technology has become so accessible, having short films is almost expected. Um, so it, it, so so much of what I did before moving here didn't in a most literal, tangible way matter. What mattered critically was the skills I had developed. Um, so if I would say, what do you want to bring with you? I'd say a really strong knowledge of your craft. However it is that you create that, that was the most important thing to me because it wasn't what I had created in the past that helped me to break in. It was what I created in the present and the future. I, I didn't have a single TV sample when I moved here. Um, I didn't have a single TV sample. Uh, it was six months before I got my first job, you know, that kind of thing. Wow. It wasn't about what I brought. It was about the skill set I brought. So when I did decide I was going to pr pursue TV here because there's so much more opportunity, um, and there really is. I'm a native New Yorker. I, I'd love to say you can do it from anywhere, but TV really does feel like it needs to be here. And when you're trying to break in, an area that has a lot of opportunity looks very attractive. Um, so I decided to go for it and basically did everything I could to write the strongest pilot, original pilot sample that I could. Um, and I think why in my case it worked is because I had, you know, for the eight years before been making work, mm -hmm. um, as much work as I could in every way, helping out. I read for everybody's scripts and gave it like I did everything I could. And I didn't even understand the skill set. Like I just knew I was making something was tangible. It wasn't until I had to make something new and try to break into this market that I realized every single thing we're doing matters. It just may not matter how you expect. They're not gonna look at your film probably and say, incredible, come right for me. But you're gonna take everything you've learned, write something that is gonna make that happen for you. I have two questions. One, did you move to LA and then decide to pursue TV writing or was that always the plan in coming to LA? Was it to do TV? It was not the plan. <laughs> <laughs> So the plan was, I I will guess, because I'm not dissimilar from my friends, probably the same plan all my friends would have coming out here who are like me, we're going to write and direct. And we're going to figure out how to write and direct and how we're going to break in as writers and directors. Um, and we're going to put as many chips on the table because you don't know how you're going to break in. So I'll try to push writing. I'll try to push directing. I'll try to push. So I showed up for year one like that. And after a year, I felt like I'd made no progress. And I didn't feel like I knew a whole lot more about the industry either. Um, so what I ended up doing was uh, I ended up hiring a, a screenwriting career coach. Um, I felt like I moved across the country and spent a year learning to drive because I didn't know how to drive when I moved here. <laughs> I'm like a good New Yorker. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I felt like that's all I really did. Now, I loved being here. It's absolutely beautiful. I made great friends. Like all the personal stuff was great. But I, after a year, I had absolutely no idea like what I was supposed to do. And I mean, truly. Um, so I'd known this career coach through this um, Twitter chat called Script Chat. Her name is Lee Jessup. And so I reached out to her and basically told her my story, started working with her. And the first thing she had me do was to pick a focus. You know, and again, the, the kind of the analogy that's been used is the idea of like, I'm trying to go in, in through the writer door and I'm trying to go in through the director door. And so it's no wonder I'm hitting the wall in the middle. Like I am not putting every egg into a basket, which you're told not to, but in this case, I think it made a huge difference. So looking at all of my options, which were basically writing for TV, directing for TV, writing for film, directing for film, it's pretty much the way to break it down. She encouraged me to pick one. And, and I had to think about it, <laughs> I'll be honest. Um, I really thought I'd be the film person. Like I absolutely, it's just what I saw in the world. Um, but when she had asked me to pick, I went back and looked at my own work and my own writing and realized I write episodically. I write, you know, I make short films. I made a trilogy out of the gate. Okay. Like that was my, in my instinct was if you're going to create a world, like why would you tell one story in it? 
So when I thought about my instinct as a writer, I thought, you know, TV could be a great match. And I made that choice and I had no samples. And so it began that journey <laughs> toward learning and writing and trying to figure out. And Lee really guided me the whole way, which was truly invaluable. And it's always tough to recommend something that costs money. Um, that's always so difficult. Uh, I have found personally that the money I have invested in that relationship has come back to me so many fold and no, I get no kickbacks on this, um, <laughs> but, I ha but it has just made such a difference. It's, it's Lee is like the best mentor you're probably never going to have in, in, because she is so dedicated. This is all of her time. She's never too busy making her own work. She coaches and she coaches the hell out of it. Like she really walked me step by step into how to break in this way. So what were those steps beyond yeah. developing the those new pilots? Well, right now, really the big thing, if you're gonna break into TV, is all of the fellowships. Fellowships and labs, and it's not like every single one up and down the chain, because they're not all gonna move the needle. Um, it really is that handful of programs that, uh, honestly, for me, I think it's the handful of programs that reps look to. That's that's kind of if, if I would prefer that over producers and execs, because at the end of the day, one great rep will connect you with all the producers and, ex and execs. Um, so so for me, I, you know, and I didn't understand that at the time, but I realized looking back, it really was about getting repped. Um, and so those programs where reps, they see the list of who's been accepted and immediately contact everyone to read their sample. Mm -hmm. Those are the places if you can be lucky enough to get in that make a huge difference pretty quickly. Not for everyone, every story is unique. My previous question that I mentioned before um, was about your sample. Is it just fresh, a fresh story, or did you adapt a feature that maybe you had written or some other piece? Um, I absolutely adapted. So my expectation was that this was gonna be a very long process, um, which is an appropriate expectation. And so I was adopt adapting for the first sample because I wanted to be able to focus on the TV writing structure and not focus on the storytelling, the characters, the world, um, you know, because I was there to learn. Mm -hmm. So I, that trilogy of short films I made, um, I ended up adapting that into a pilot, into a TV pilot. And that's what um, ended up working for me. Cool. And, and when you were talking about uh, labs and fellowships, so uh, fun fact is our last episode was about screenwriting competition. So I'm curious which ones uh, were the ones that you were specifically targeting, the ones that you've heard are the ones that are, are getting the rep reach outs and whatnot. Um, I'm doing this off the top of my head, so I'm sure I'll forget. No so worries. Obviously, all of the network fellowships, that's a given. Sure, um, sure. So, you know, NBC, ABC, CBS, whatever, HBO, all of that stuff is a given. Um, in addition to that, I broke in through the Blacklist uh, Women in Film Episodic Lab. The Blacklist Labs, I actually had no idea how powerful they were. They're very, very powerful. Um, the industry looks at who gets into those labs and is presuming they want to know them in some way. Like, it, their labs are super powerful. Um, obviously, Sundance <laughs> goes without saying. I would, I, I'm trying to think, I, oh, I submitted to Film Independent. And then if you have any, okay, there's a sidebar, if you have any um, diversity elements, there's often um, a lab that can work for that. Um, I know from, for I'm Latina, and so there's NHMC, which is the National Hispanic Media Coalition, so I submitted to that as well. So again, um, I, I know there's one for, just for different groups, so you want to find those particular labs. But again, they need to be the ones that I almost want to say if they announce it in deadline, that's probably a good idea. And I know that seems sure. very she-she and like who gets announced in deadline. Mm -hmm. is, I don't, reps are not going through those long lists of contests, you know, right. uh, like quarterfinals and semifinals. They're just not going through that stuff. Um, they're looking at deadline. When they see that you put up a list of who's in your lab, that's where they're plucking from. So and as tough as it is to say, that's certainly a way to backtrack and figure out if it's getting announced then you and you get in, you're absolutely going to get some attention. So that first year that you were in L.A. kind of hustling, figuring out what you were doing, um, what were you doing for work, if you don't mind talking that through? Freelance, um, copy, like marketing copywriter. I've been doing it for... 15 years, <laughs> okay. um, just kind of like, you know, the money thing that you do. Um, years ago, my husband and I owned a like website design and development company. And I did all the like writing and editorial. He did all the design, that sort of thing. 
And um, when I when we dissolved that business, I kept all the clients um, and just kept doing, you know, like copywriting for them. Um, in addition, again, I know transparency is your thing. My husband, and that has been very important. Mm -hmm. um, he works mm -hmm. in tech and he does well. Um, and I know that that's critical for a lot of people. I know a lot of folks who do have the, you know, relationship where one one partner is um, kind of holding down the bills while the other partner kind of goes for something crazy. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm definitely in one of those and um, and Same. really glad it worked. Out. Yeah, no, it, and it, but it's yeah. it's huge. Like there should be an award like at every, you know, like the Oscars should have best supportive spouse. You know, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're really yeah. because it's, it's, it's kind of one of those unspoken things is, you know, a lot of people break in because they have that support, because they have that person and not everyone gets that. Um, yeah. So, you know, I don't, don't want to not mention that that's absolutely part of my story. Totally. Man, we appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, let's talk about like meeting people. We've got a question from Autumn Shanko who asks, how do you move across the country where you probably don't have a job lined up? Like what a, what is, what's going through your head that helps you make that decision? Um, well, my, my, I will, again, I will say my husband got to keep his job. That's um, when we moved and that was, and I'm, and I work, was working freelance. Um, I, what I will say is, is it was one of those crazy situations where he told his boss is the best way I can phrase it. <laughs> oh, I'm moving to LA, like dot, 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 waiting to see where the problem was. And they just never said anything. Like it was very <laughs> strange. And then he starts working remotely and it's just like, it was I don't know, maybe it's just because he's in tech, maybe it's, there's a certain flexibility that way. I know they just, they're not as chained to their desks the way the rest of us are mentally. Um, and so, yeah, he, we just moved. Like <laughs> there was, at any point, things could have gone wrong in that way. But I, I think it really comes down to, the, I mean, it's a leap of faith. I mean, it's a leap mm -hmm. of faith. Some people can, ha can have a better safety net than others. Um, some people can't. I feel like emotionally, it's always a leap of faith. So even, you know, one person might have everything lined up perfectly, but emotionally, they're always going to be stressed about it. Another person can have nothing. <laughs> and emotionally, they're going to be like, I'm going to roll with it. So, you know, it's, I guess it's figuring out what will get you to, to do it. <laughs> you know, if, if you really want to do it, then who am I and what will get to do it? Me? I'm a rip off the Band-Aid person. You move me in 11 weeks. That's how I move. <laughs> you, <know? laughs> you give it six months. It's too much time to think, and I may or not, may or not have done it. So yeah, I'm an 11 week old. You figure out which type you are, and then just kind of railroad yourself into it. I mean, if it's really what you want, you got to figure it out. And I know that's easier said than done. I promise, I really do. And I did move a child, and that's such a hard thing for people to do, you know. And it worked great. He's thrilled. He's truly a California boy now. It's it's, it's really sweet. <laughs> when you were moving and thinking you were going to do the writer director thing. Did you feel like you were abandoning all of the collaborators you had built in New York? And like, how are you going to replace all of those positions? Well, I definitely didn't feel like it was abandoning. <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> that's me projecting my own, my own. <laughs> it does come later, to be genuine. That oh. feeling does, well, right out of the gate, I wasn't, what was I doing for anybody? Like, I'm your, I'm people's friends, and every once in a while I could set up a short film, but I'm not, like, making anybody's career. So I didn't mm -hmm. have that feeling. Um, how was I going to replace them? To be honest, in terms of like production, I was going to get, find a great producer here. Um, I actually, the, the producer, uh, the second producer, because my husband produces my, my work as well. The second producer on my middle two short films of four lives out in LA. And so I just kind of would plug back in with her. I, it, it's LA. I wasn't worried about getting crew. Mm -hmm. Um, I figured I, I'd be able to find it, um, when it came, as far as abandoning, I think that in a weird way feels much more real now. And it feels real now because I'm on a TV show and I'm on a sci-fi show and I'm on a Netflix show. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly what all those crews invest in. They're investing in you breaking in like this. And right now there's nothing I can do. <laughs> like I, I don't, I'm the lowest person, you know, in the hierarchy in almost the entire industry right now. Like, you know, there's a few people who broke in like in the last month, maybe they're coming up behind me, but there's very few people behind me. Um, I don't hire, mm -hmm. I don't crew, I don't cast. All those favors are sitting in my heart. <laughs> and right. Christine, I know you know the feeling. Yeah. Um, 
but it, it's it, I would have to be a whole lot higher up. So that that is, I don't know. You carry it. You hope you you hope you had good sets. You hope you had good productions. You hope your projects helped all the other crew members to get onto something else. Um, but yeah, you do kind of have to walk away, walk into this big new machine, and hope at some point you'll have your hand on the wheel and you can bring some people in. And that actually kind of leads into a question from uh, Selenia, who asks, how do you set up a network in LA prior to moving, or is that even necessary? How do you build a new crew of people, not just to produce, but people that, you know, you're going to move into and, and know and have a place to support yourself? I didn't know a lot of people when I came here. I'll tell you that. I had one good friend from New York. Um, I have friends from New York who moved, so I, ha I have sure. some friends that way. Um and I have one really close friend from New York who is a TV writer and who, I'm trying to think, she basically broke in before I moved here, but really took off sometime around the time I was here. Otherwise, it's really no different than how you network anywhere else, you know. Um, use social media to figure out who's where and doing what. You go to events. Uh, you go to you go to mixers. You go to screenings. You do all the same things, and you just build it. You build it from the ground up. I haven't found, like, for example, I, I don't get invited to any of like the cool horror parties around town. I'm not like networked well enough. <laughs> and that's what I notice. I'm like, damn, I don't get to go to the cool places. But it hasn't been an issue of, can I reach out? Like, you just always figure it out. I, I wouldn't, it's nice to know somebody before you get here. But thanks to social media, I mean, you always will figure out where to go and who to meet. And, you know, there's always people out at some mixer and then you just kind of go from there. Um, the other thing I did was I joined the Women in organizations, so Women in Film, mm. uh, Women in Media, and the Alliance of Women Directors. I, I joined all three of those right when I got here, and that was where I started all my networking, um, were with those groups. And then very quickly, again, like everything, it's very viral, you know, what the events are, where to go, who to play with, that kind of thing. Um, so I didn't feel like I needed a network before I got here. Good to know. Cool. All right. So we have a, a couple questions from Shauna uh, on Twitter. So the first question is, uh, she asks, is it true that it's easier to get into TV writing from writing features or is it the other way around? Have you seen anybody going back and forth through those two worlds? Having not done it myself personally, I'm not sure I'd have the best answer. I think I, I'll talk about TV. Um, so that's sure. where I've had opportunity. I hear that you can submit a feature to get staffed. I really hear that it's going to be harder. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, you know, at the end of the day, you know, for, for a one hour drama, you're giving 55, 60 pages. You're, and this showrunner is getting, I have no idea, 100, 200. I really don't know what they read. And they're going to read it in a certain order. <laughs> mm -hmm. They're going to read it based on recommendation. They're going to read it and they're going to read it based on page length. So my gut tells me if you can write a pilot to break into TV, do it. Um, you just you just need to get read. And that's the better way. And to uh, I think we've already kind of pretty well covered this just from your own experiences. But she had a follow up question about, do you need a screenwriting degree to write for a TV show? Absolutely no. not. No, no way. Say. <laughs> I don't even know if I needed a college degree. It is very much. And even though this is without question a commercial business, it still has art rules in a certain way. Um, no, you need absolutely no degrees. You need to be good on the page, not not on a. On the <laughs> Has wall. your education <laughs> ever come up at any point in generals when you were meeting with reps? Never once. <laughs> Never once. Not once <laughs> has anyone ever. In fact, my undergraduate degree. I'm not even sure what that's doing for me anymore. And that I would always encourage someone to get is you know, but. Yeah, <laughs> none of none of it matters. It's just what skills you've developed. That said, I love taking classes. It has nothing to do with degrees or I love taking classes. I thrive in classes. So whatever it takes to get the skills, I would do it. That's great. I'm curious if you do still have the directing like desire in the back of your mind of do you feel like there's a point at which you're you think you'll have the footing in writing for TV that you could like go direct something and not lose that that footing that you have? A hundred percent I plan on doing that. Okay. Um, this is not I haven't changed my goals. I've changed my strategy. So 
things that I, I, so the first thing I did is when I was meeting with reps um, or rep, I uh, told them my full story and that I had no intentions of not directing. But I did understand we're moving in through the TV writing world, so we'll figure it out. They get that and it happens all the time. Cool. The next one is there's a lot more opportunity to shadow TV directors when you're already on a show. Mm-hmm. So those opportunities are those I'll take advantage of post COVID, <laughs> you know, any opportunities I could have had in this first year, were obviously I'll take it up with, you know, having as few people on set as possible, but that's absolutely part of my plan. Um, I would love to make another short film. At, right now I have the privileged problem of not quite being able to have the time because I am working professionally, um, but I very much want to, but I'm a hundred percent still planning to move in to continue forward in directing, um, but trying to do it using some of the advantages I've been able to create through TV writing. Awesome. So I know you've told this story many times and I apologize for asking you to tell it again, but can you please tell the story of basically the meeting that got you staffed and specifically you, how your like upbringing played into that so so yes so what my so I'll, i'm actually going to go back to my first short film because it's all a trajectory um when i decided to direct for the first time like everyone who does it who doesn't have a lot of resources you look around and see what do you have right you see what what's my advantage what can i make something bigger up so i grew up um in a funeral home family in new york city above our family's funeral home and so that was an incredibly unique resource and that's why I chose to make my first short film set in a funeral home and about, you know, the undead. And like, I totally went for it in that fashion, but it was very much using what I had. And then I moved forward and I really didn't necessarily think about that whole world again until I had to write that pilot. Um, and I realized that after making films and taking them you know, on the road to film festivals, you start to learn which part of your work really connects with people, what's what's fascinating to them, what's interesting. And the funeral home world was very interesting to people. Everybody wanted to talk about it, and I don't blame them one bit. So I, I you know, I wrote that pilot, and I think part of why I, I got into the lab that I got into is because they always make you write an essay, some sort of personal essay. And I figured out how to get my pilot and my essay and my personal backstory and every single part of me to be all on the same page and really ran it all through the lens of growing up in a funeral home. Um, and, and I think by doing that and by saying I write horror and leaning into those elements of, you know, my writing and my personality, I think it showed the lab and then the reps that, that I understand I need to be specific, I need to be hireable, I need to be very quickly, be able to be summed up, um, not because we're being diminished, but think of it, of it like a game of telephone. Like, you can't go out in the world and represent yourself to every single person who needs to know about you. Therefore, you wanna have the kind of story that, if I came in and told you my story and walked out, and you said, oh, she writes horror and she grew up in a funeral home, and that's all you remembered. <laughs> I'm getting to the next like level here. Like right. it's gonna work. You're gonna tell that to your boss, and that's all you need to say. And they're like, "There's something weird and cool there. I want to know more about it. Let me read the sample, and then you hope the sample is good." Um, so I really feel like it, in my case, it really helped to have that very tight, focused sense of of the work I want to make out of the gate. Now I can change. I can do it. I can write something new and go in a different direction. But I made it really clear how you could fit me into an industry that's already like cranking and not looking to make space for me, but I could find a spot for myself. I'm not sure it worked literally for the the Chucky job. Um, of course, the showrunner loved the funeral home background. And in fact, okay, so this work, he had written, Don Mancini wrote uh, an episode of Tales from the Crypt mm. and his episode took place in a funeral home. So don't think I didn't bring that up at my meeting. <laughs> like there was no part of his work that I didn't dive into. So yeah, I, I you know I, I mentioned that in the meeting. Um, I think across the board, people who were doing horror see the advantage of someone who has a weird relationship with the dead. Like it's just what it is, and mm-hmm. and and a knowledge of a certain amount of the the physiology of death and the death care industry. And things that are anything from like 
haunting of Hill House to Law and Order. Like they could use my skill set. Like there's something right. to someone who thinks that way. Um, so I, I do think it helped me a lot. I think it kind of gives me horror cred. Um, you know, even if you know, they look at me and you know, maybe they think I'm horror, or they not. But then I say I grew up in a funeral home and everybody's like, oh, all right, no, that shit's legit. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so when uh, the Chucky room ended, what was it like to, because I know that obviously when people talk about like breaking in, there's sort of this implicit assumption early on that it's like, well, once you're in, you're in. But obviously the reality is that, you know, rooms don't last forever and you're not guaranteed your next slot. So what was that like finishing your first room and kind of looking into the vast expanse of, okay, what's next? Well, terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> As most vast expanses are. <laughs> so I'd heard from a number of people. And so okay, I get people go back and forth. Like half the people say your first job's the hardest, half say the second job's the hardest. <laughs> um, so I just decided they're all the hardest. And um, I wrapped the Chucky room during the pandemic. So on top of all your normal fears, will I ever staff again? There was also the whole world, like I didn't know if they were gonna make shows. I didn't know if they were gonna have rooms. I didn't know what the heck was happening. We wrapped in May. So I was really paranoid. I'll be honest. I, I, I didn't rest or relax or, or recoup in any way. I just I just wanted that next job. And I was very fortunate. About three months later, I was in a new room, uh, immediately regretting that I hadn't relaxed at all or you know, <laughs> done my laundry or did anything except just be paranoid about getting that next job. I've learned better now. I'm between rooms right now. But yeah, it, it is it is scary. There's that feeling of, you know, if it's this big bubble, this Hollywood industry, and you came in through the bottom, like, just shake the bubble and I fall right out. Like, there's that feeling, you can't help it. You feel like you're just so close to where you were, why it seems vulnerable. I feel less vulnerable now, I'll be honest, after the second job. Um, I feel like having a track record, having a niche, having good reps, um, I don't feel as vulnerable as I did. Um, that said, looking for that next job. Any showrunners are listening, give me a call. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, some backstory since, Kim, this is the first time you and I are actually getting to speak, although hopefully not the last. Uh, I'm literally moving to L.A. in the next, like, three months. Currently, I'm staying at my childhood home in Colorado as my fiancé and I get, become fully vaccinated because it was sort of like, why would we move to another big city and just see the inside of an apartment over and over again when we could live here for free and have a dog nearby. So um, what's something you wish you would had kn you had known prior to moving to LA, if anything? Where, where did you start? Did you start in New York or? No. So I grew up here in Colorado in a tiny little town where nobody knows anybody. Um, and then went to college in Oregon, went to grad school in New York. Yeah, I did two degrees, both useless, except for the teaching jobs that pay my bills. And uh, now I'm moving from New York to LA via Colorado and like six months. <laughs> so I think the thing that helped me the most um, was my point of view, was my frame of mind. So something I learned, Christina, is New York and LA have a rivalry, but it's really only one way. <laughs> it's New York against LA. LA don't notice, don't care. <laughs> All my life, I've thought we're like, New York versus L.A., New York versus L.A., but it turns out that was one way all along. New York <laughs> L.A. really just doesn't care in the best way. So I think the best thing that I did was I didn't come to L.A. looking mm. for New York. Mm. I didn't come to L.A. looking for anything but L.A. And really, really excited to see something new. Um, is the transportation in New York easier? Oh, my God, Yes. That said, is the weather in L.A. nicer? Oh, my God, yes. So, <laughs> I think the thing is don't don't hold on to the things from the past. I mean, now we're getting philosophical, but don't hold on to what you loved about the place you used to live. Put all that energy into figuring out what you love about the place you live in now. Um, and there's so many great things and there's some pain in the ass things everywhere. So when you come here, just look for the things that bring you joy and just kind of move on from the things that you're not into. Traffic is traffic. I don't know what to say. <laughs> yeah, and I, I definitely have the upper hand. Yeah, I have the privilege that you guys don't have, which is that I grew up in the West. So like, I already knew how to drive. I love driving. I don't even mind traffic. And I know people keep saying like, well, LA traffic's different. I'm like, traffic is traffic. And I'm fine with it. It's better than being on a subway stuck underground for two hours, no air conditioning. Like I'd always 100% of the time rather be in my own dang car. But that's a that's a separate rant that we're not talking about today. 
So my my next question is actually kind of uh, inspired by the commute horror stories that everyone gives out. Um, and it, it is if somebody is moving to Los Angeles, like to ostensibly work in the film and television industry, uh, is living further away from the city like a genuine detriment? Do you think that that's changing now that the pandemic has made a lot of stuff go online? Like how close to, you know, the Hollywood sign do you think that it matters that you be when moving for the first time? That's a good question. Um, I mean, I guess the better answer is the closer, the better. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) Um, But close in LA is a completely different thing from what I knew in New York. Close in LA is like, like almost like a whole seaboard. Like it's <laughs> the expectations that people live spread out is so much wider. Um, I live in the Valley. I live in Burbank. One of the, one of the things I was told before I moved by this very dear friend of mine, her name is Erica Rosby. Everybody should look her up and love her. <laughs> she uh, basically said, don't not look at the Valley. Like you hear, you know, everyone says, oh, the real city's on one side of the hill, but you know, the <laughs> other city on the other side doesn't count. And, she, and what she basically said, cause it's all about driving. She was like, yeah, it's fine on the other side of the hill, except you have to drive everywhere anyway. So at least on this side of the hill, you actually can find a parking spot at the Trader Joe's. You can actually go to the, you know. And mm-hmm. I was like, okay, I'll be open to the valley. I love it. I absolutely love it. And, we, and for the first time in our lives, my husband and I bought a place we've never owned. Congratulations. Thank you so much. It's such a huge deal. <laughs> um, a place in Burbank, and we really love it. Um, that said, if you look at a map, like if I have a meeting in Santa Monica, woo we that's going to be, you know, <laughs> it's going to be your whole day. <laughs> it's going to be a day. But Burbank also has like a number of studios in it. You know, it it, mm-hmm. it really depends. You had no idea like in TV writing where you're going to end up working. Um, so there's really no point in trying to pick your home based on where you work. Certainly not your first home, especially. Yeah. I would <laughs> say as close as you can get reasonable to your budget, um, because it just will mean less commuting is all it will be. Sure. I guess the, the too far is if you can't get somewhere that day. <laughs> I guess that's the best, you know, then you go there. <laughs> do you think that any of that is going to change post COVID? Like, do you think that more networking events will be virtual? Do you think more meetings and generals like that will be virtual? Or do you think everyone's just like desperate to get back to normal? I think it depends. I think, and again, I, I can't know. I bet you some things will stay virtual. Like if you're in a writer's group and you're all over town, you know, and you've all been like hoofing it, like, or not, I guess you don't hoof driving it to, uh, you know, that, that to me, uh, my writer's group went up, went virtual. Now we're going to get back together because we're all madly in love with each other. But I could see <laughs> if, you know, if it was a little bit more, like, we got to get this work done. Why drive across towns? So things like that. I can see being remote, uh, like events, like mixers and stuff. I don't know. I'm not sure. I, I mean, I don't think they'd work as well. And then the big one for me is writer's rooms. I don't, I don't think they're going to stay remote. I don't, um, I, I don't think, I think any advantage and, and I could be wrong, but any advantage to the bottom line, the studio or, you know, our network gets for not having people renting space, eating food, you know, all the things you do in an office. Um, I think you lose to that environment in the room. I think it, there's just no comparison to having those in-person relationships, those in-person brainstorms those little side conversations um it is not it, we're not like f- putting numbers in a spreadsheet this is such deep creative work that takes time and relationships mm-hmm. um and so i personally would not want to see writers rooms stay remote um that's my opinion that's what i'm hoping for I, I haven't talked to any writer who wants that who wants it to be remote so my guess is that will will go back to the way it was but other little things mm-hmm. might stay online the little inconveniences. That makes sense. So um, logistically, when like looking for a place, especially when you don't, you're not physically there, did you and your husband like visit LA to like apartment hunt or did you do it all virtually and then just move and show up at your new place? We had been to LA twice <laughs> for okay. Holly Shorts, the film festival, sure, um, sure, sure. before moving, but that's it. Uh, we really just did not know LA. This was just that total leap. So what we did is we just used the internet like crazy. Um, I, I don't remember if we Zillowed or Redfin or whatever we did, uh, looking for rentals and looking for our price range. We, because we had a kid, um, we had to look for good school districts, all that kind of stuff. Like there was just other things to go into it. And um, we planned a trip um, two months before, 
less than that, um, a month before we moved to find an apartment. Yeah, it was within a month because we signed a lease right on it. We came, we set up all the apartment um, viewings in advance. So over two days, so, so for day one, we were going to drive to all the neighborhoods we had selected. And day two and three, we're going to look at the apartments. We had set up appointments. After day one, we realized we had no idea about the neighborhoods and changed all of our appointments and ended up moving a lot of the stuff we thought wasn't as attractive, like Burbank, to be honest, which seemed, I don't know about what a Burbank is. Um, and we moved those to the first day of our looking. And then some of the places that everyone was like, oh, you're going to love it. And I didn't feel strong about, we moved to the second day. Um, so that was kind of how we handled that. Then we went and saw the, the apartments and fell madly in love with our play, the apartment we started in in Burbank and signed a lease. So we did it all in one week. Wow. We came out here, looked at, drove around neighborhoods, looked at the apartment appointments we'd set up, picked a place, signed a lease, put down a deposit, <laughs> went back to New York, told our current landlord we were breaking the lease, dealt with that, and then uh, <laughs> took off the next month and moved out here. Wow. Are there, have you found there to be any like unique quirks about find, like apartment hunting in Los Angeles that are different from New York? Are there things that you can do in LA that like New Yorkers would be like, what? Like for me, I was talking to my brother who also lives in Burbank. He's a, he's a PA on a bunch of stuff. Um, and he's been living in LA for like five years, I think. And I remember talking to him about like what we were looking for. He was like, where are you guys looking to move? I'm like, I don't know, LA. I don't know anything. I was like, but I, I'm thinking as we're being picky, you know, before we actually have to move while we're still living with mom, I'm going to like put, you know, in unit laundry is one of my preferences. And I know that seems crazy. He's like, what do you mean? That's probably option. He's like, definitely there will be laundry in building. And I was like, what? What do you mean? Definitely blew my mind that that was just like a <laughs> thing that LA just has. So I'm curious if there are other like little <laughs> secrets to apartment hunting that might delight or terrify me and the others that are like me. Um, well, obviously I could only speak within the um, price range we were looking. So sure. obviously I can't tell you across the board. I'd say there's almost a slightly more like suburban conveniences <laughs> in, in LA apartments than in New York apartments, like dishwashers and, and washing machines and outdoor space. Um, like all that yeah. stuff seems a little <laughs> bit more prevalent. Uh, for me, the big one was like in New York, you have to put down so much money to get an apartment. I'm trying to remember. It's like first month rent, deposit, Next month. So it was like three months rent, it felt like, to get an apartment. None of that was here. And I still don't understand it. I kept trying to figure out. We had so much money to get an apartment. We're like, here's all the cash we've saved up. Take it all. Take it all. And they're like just pulling a couple bills out going, no, we don't need all that. Thank you. I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> um, it's cheaper. As expensive as it is, only a New Yorker or maybe someone from San Francisco could say L.A. is cheaper. But it's cheaper than New York and San Francisco. Yeah, for me, the biggest one was it just costs a lot less money. That's encouraging to hear. They're not asking <laughs> for like 50 million months rent, uh -huh. you know, in advance. <laughs> and, and I was surprised and pleased. Do there tend to be brokers and like broker fees? Because I know that's, you know, it's hit or miss in New York as well. Um, no, no, I don't remember any broker fees. Um, I'm trying to think if we used brokers. No, we didn't actually use brokers. We we were doing all apartment buildings. And so we were just going through like the rental office, that kind of thing. But because we set everything in advance, it was we made it easy on ourselves. Yeah, I don't remember. I don't think we used a broker at all. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that this is all extremely encouraging to hear. Um, but yeah, Christina, any any other questions lingering for you about what we talked about? I don't think so. Kim, you've been so like so much just a wealth of information. I know Thank I keep like for... mentally being like, all right, we're going to quote that. All right, we're going to make a quote graphic out of that. Like truly <laughs> incredible how you are able to speak and just like n knock them off one after another. Really, really impressive. I guess, Kim, is there anything else that you feel like you haven't advised us on? warned us about a funny story you haven't told us anything that we're leaving out of this conversation i've listened to all these podcasts and i've watched all the panels and i've done it. and that's why I, I know to share as much as i humanly possibly can because once you finally have that opportunity and you have your own break-in story i think that's when you realize just how unique they all are there are certain things that are across the board and there's very few, I, I want to say good writing across the board, but even that, you never know. Uh, you, know um, you know, there's got to be people out there who don't got it and still got it. 
so so I, I guess the big thing is is the hardest thing is try not to compare and that's the hardest mm-hmm. hardest thing to do because you just don't know what your journey is going to be like until it's in the past I broke in when I moved to LA really quickly. I never expected that. That's not me. That's not my life. That's not how anything has ever gone for me ever. <laughs> um, so I was shocked. So so the reverse can happen. You can come feeling like you got it and you probably do and you've got it all together and it could take time. Um, so, you know, I guess find your tribe, like everybody says, so that you, you know, you have people to commiserate with. Learn as much as you can, listen to the stories, but then remember that that is someone else's story. That's not your path. What can you learn from their story that applies to your really particular life? And I feel like this is where we started. I don't know what's going on in either of your lives. Only you do. I don't know what makes you happy. I don't know what's, you know, I don't know anything about you that's the crux of whether you're going to, you know, make this move or not. Um, so just really keep it personal. You know, it's really none of anyone else's business. Honestly, you know, find your happiness, find your path, find good people to support and love you and do your best always. And I I, I say this to myself and try not to compare. You know, that's their journey. That's not yours. That's great. And I think that's that's really great. Probably a great place to leave it. So, Christina, do you want to you want to talk us out? Yeah. Thanks again, Kim. And thanks so much to Kelsey Rauber for our theme music, Kaylee Brown for our podcast art, Ezra Lee for editing this episode, and to all of you for listening. Links to learn more about them and Kim are in our episode description. And thank you to our booby VIPs who are $10 patrons on Patreon. Shannon Sprangler, Jules Piggott, Rain Bernal, Kelsey Rauber, Jerry Maravia, Norman Steinberg, and Shana Rose Woolley. If you would like a name shout out at the end of every episode, please feel free to subscribe at patreon.com slash breaking out pod to get bonus content at $3 or more a month, or just a reminder of new episodes to support this podcast for $1 a month, our new tier. And definitely make sure to rate us five stars on your favorite podcast app if you haven't already. And also actually writing a review does make a big difference. And it also brightens our spirits. And don't you want that? We're just three gals out here doing our best. So please, uh, whatever little paragraph you want to write to us uh, we would love to see it next episode we are going to be uh, breaking down negative reviews and trolls so if that is something that you struggle with or you're just curious to hear our nastiest online stories definitely check in then Uh, but thanks so much for listening and we'll see y'all next time